Gracious Heavenly Father, we're again thankful for the access to stand before you without condemnation as we consider the greatness of the sacrifice that Christ has made for us, that we are members of your family and of your household, that we are in fact the body of Christ, crucified, buried, and raised with him to walk in newness of life. May we rejoice in the completeness of what God has done for us in Christ. Seal to our hearts only that which is truth. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're in the area of the 25th verse of chapter 1 of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 verse 25. So far, we've seen that Christ is God Almighty, that He became incarnate in human flesh, the very God who spoke the worlds into existence, by which all things were created, who is also before all things, and by whom all things are held together, the Jesus that we worship, who walked the streets of Jerusalem, who was betrayed by His own people, who was falsely condemned and sentenced to die on the cross is the Jesus who rose from the dead, the God who came that we might be presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight, and that ought to stop us dead in our tracks. Just, you know, the fact that God did this for us. In just this first chapter, we see the completeness of the work of Christ. In the 21st verse, we have a very direct statement by God that since He, in the person of His Son, has made us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight, we will continue in the faith. And that there is no question at all about that. We come to the 25th verse, and we find the Holy Spirit saying that Paul has been given a dispensation, a stewardship, that is what the word means, and we find in other passages of Scripture that a portion of that stewardship has been given to us. Christ said to His people Israel, Ye are my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea into the outermost parts of the earth, and they are that, but to you and to me. He declared, God declared, that we are ambassadors for Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. This is one reason why I've gone dispensational or I've leaned heavily toward the dispensational aspect of Scripture as it regards prophecy. The stewardship that we see here is a stewardship to fulfill or to complete the Word of God. In verse 26, the meaning of the word mystery is not, you know, as we would normally use it, mystery like, you know, as used by uh, well, like, well, it's really a mystery to me why my horse is so stupid, you know, that sort of thing. It's a, uh, the word mystery in Scripture is not how we would typically use that in common everyday English language. We tend to look at the, the, the word mystery and, and think of this as something that we just can't possibly understand or we can't possibly know, or that something that God, it's something that God has hidden. But what we learn in studying through this text, as well as all of the other references to the word mystery, is the fact that that's not the case at all. Paul has been given a dispensation, a stewardship, and that stewardship has been given to us. Christ said to his people, Israel, ye are my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and, and to, throughout all the earth. But to you and me, he declared that we are ambassadors for Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The stewardship is a stewardship to fulfill or to complete the Word of God. These passages are telling us a lot here. Mystery, as used by the Holy Spirit, infers something that was previously unknown because it was not previously revealed by God. Yet we know, because God has to us revealed it, many things 
In fact, if you do a word study on the word mystery, you'll see that God has revealed much to us, which he refers to as a mystery, or was a mystery, or still is a mystery to, to, to those who can't uh, receive it or hear it. For unto you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it has not been given, Matthew 13, 11. And now we are told that a special dispensation, a stewardship, was committed to Paul, who had been made a minister of God, a servant of God, a slave of God, according to this stewardship, to fulfill, to complete the Word of God. Now, despite what many people believe, no person today can say that they have received further additional revelation from God. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the, prophet, the prophets, or through the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Hebrews 1, verse, verses 1 and 2. So the purpose of the word mystery is simply to identify a truth which can only be known by revelation. You can't know it through reasoning, uh, through rational, you know, human logic or scientific evaluation or anything else. You must be told. And that's all the that really that the word means. It doesn't mean that it's something that we can't comprehend. It's a word which indicates that this is something that God must tell us or we can't know it. And we now have a direct statement of Scripture that all that God intends to tell us, He's done so in this book. And he's, in particular, he's done so in these epistles. Theologically, if you sat down to, to, to write some, something like, you know, somewhat of a statement of faith, a statement of the doctrinal position that you hold, you know, for a body of believers that are fellowshipping together in the name of Christ, that doctrine would come from these epistles. No, I mean, you'd have fabulous illustrations of that doctrine in the Old Covenant, the Gospels and the, and the Old Covenant, Old Testament. But if you were to sit down and you were to list your doctrinal position so that somebody, you know, that might have a, an overview, a synopsis of what you think that the Scriptures teach, you'd get it from the epistles. We not only have a statement here that Paul has been given a stewardship to complete the Word of God, but that statement is so all-inclusive that it eliminates any other possibility, any possibility of further revelation by God. I don't believe that God, and I've mentioned this in, in the past, it's, it's, I know it's uh, confused or even offended you know, some people. I'm, I'm firmly convinced that if Jesus Christ Himself were here today, he would have nothing to say that he hasn't already said in this book. What God intends that we hear, he gave us in his word. We have the completion of our doctrinal understanding in these epistles. This is what God has purposely kept hidden from ages and, and from generations, but now makes it manifest. It's going to carry us through to the end, folks. And it's an aorist. He did it. It isn't being made manifest. There isn't going to be further manifestation. Verse 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And man, is that a mouthful. I mean, these are, are profound thoughts that the Holy Spirit has presented here. And because most Christians are not interested in that which is profound, or even doctrinal, for that matter, they have little comprehension of what God has done for them in Christ. I believe God has given folks basically ministries, churches, congregations, organizations, institutions, pretty much just given them what they wanted. They, they don't want doctrine, so God hasn't given it to them, at least not revealed it to them in the enlightenment, the sense of enlightenment through the Holy Spirit. But it has been given. It's been given fully and completely. There's nothing else to be given. 
And today there's such a little comprehension of what God has done for us in Christ. The Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, the God who is timeless, that, that lives in timelessness, that exists in timelessness. The, the idea that He willed to make something known to us, I mean, I think that is utterly fantastic. And from where I sit here, you know, uh, from the position that, that, that I inhabit, this, this little grain of sand on a very small speck of dust in the universe, it seems incomprehensible that the majestic Creator would even know that I exist, let alone will to make something known to me. And, he, and what He wants to make known is not the fact that I, I'm to spend so many hours doing, you know, in, in study and, or prayer uh, to, or to do so much personal evangelism, you know, to write so many books or teach so many sermons or anything else. What He wills to make known to me is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, Christ in you, the certainty of glory. You know, virtually all of us have, I'm sure all of us have heard sermons centered around the concept of Abraham believing God and it was counted unto him for righteousness and that in essence, you know, that is, well, basically that is the gospel. That's somewhat, in a, in a, to a great extent, that defines the gospel preached today. The average comprehension of that, both in sermon as well as in listener, is that Abraham, well, he did something by which he became a child of God. That's basically the, the consensus. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He did something, God did something, in that, in that order. And in almost every place I've been in life, not only students, but ministers have told me that, Steve, what that verse says is it says Abraham did something and God rewarded him uh, with eternal life. And, it, you know, if you believe God, He'll do the same thing for you. Now, they may have not said it in exactly those same words, but basically that's the thought that they're trying to convey. I'd suggest that at least 95% of you have heard sermons centered around that theme. But how many of you have ever heard that a man became a child of God because he killed two people? I'd, I'd, I'd guess probably never. So just a, a, a quick little, you know, a bit of background history here. Israel was worshiping God as God had told them to do. And the worshipers of Baal, they came over and they said, well, hey, let's have a community service you know, at least on Easter, let's, let's get all the churches in the area together for one great service, you know. And the Israelites said, well, sounds like a great idea to me. So they went to the worship of Baal, to the Babylonian mystery, and they went home and they said, wow, this is the way God ought to be worshipped. I mean, these people, they really get into it. You know, their origins exceed anything God's revealed to us. And, and so they began to serve the idols of Baal, and, and God made it very clear that they shouldn't do that. So Israel joined in worshiping Baal, and the Lord's anger burned against them, Numbers 25, verse 3. And then after that, this, well, not so bright an individual, well, he brings this Babylonian woman into the camp, and this guy Phineas, he picks up a javelin, and he drives it through both of their stomachs. Now, that, that's a rather gory story, but, but, you know, let me finish it. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Exactly the language that's used of Abraham in Genesis and quoted in Romans chapter 4. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, I seriously doubt that any of you would believe that Phineas became a child of God because he killed those two people. You can't read that text without reaching the conclusion that Phineas was shown to be righteous because of his zeal for God, just as Abraham was. He was already righteous, just as Abraham was shown to be already righteous when he believed God. In Psalms 106 verse 7, we read, Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. 
And I'm willing to say, and I, and I say it every day, that most of God's redeemed people today, they understand not what God was doing in Jesus Christ. I don't see much comprehension of the completeness of the finished work of Jesus Christ. You know, I'm riding around in my Jeep, I turn on the radio and I hear some minister say, well, Jesus came to deliver his people from their sins and he'd do that if you just accept him. Doesn't say that. It says he came to deliver his people from their sins and he did that. It's finished. He did that. Until you begin to comprehend these simple truths, you won't understand the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is, in, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not because you believed anything, not because you accepted anything. You know, such a, a message may draw crowds. That, that may be what gets the numbers. That may be what gets the views. It may cause emotional decisions, but it is not the truth of the gospel. You were in Christ when He was crucified. You were in Christ when He was buried. You were in Christ when He rose from the dead. And God presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. In the third chapter of Colossians, starting at verse 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, for bearing one another, forgiving one another, and so on and so forth. You know, it'll be, you know, several weeks before we get there. There are opportunities and responsibilities in the family of God. As His children, we are, without question, saddled with certain responsibilities of being a child of God. Sermon after sermon will be preached on what you ought to do, you know, mercies, kindness, humbleness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. And I am not suggesting in any way that we should not comprehend those truths. In fact, I, I firmly believe we ought to take each word and look at it closely in the Greek. But every sermon I have ever heard on this passage of Scripture seems to skip over the introduction as the elect of God, holy and beloved. And I think that any fair treatment of this passage would spend 90% of the time on elect of God, holy and beloved, and 10% of the time on the rest, which follows naturally. Given the fact that this is who we are, we see ourselves as elect, holy, and beloved, and based upon that, then th this is what we do. We don't do this. We don't reverse it, folks, and say, this is all the stuff that we do, and if we do that, then we'll become elect, holy, and beloved. That, that's, it's not complicated, folks. It really isn't. What modern Christianity has turned it all on its head. It's turned it all upside down. It's put the cart before the horse. And I'm trying my best here to put the horse before the cart. Dearly beloved, listen to me. We are elect, set aside by God for His use, and loved by God. I think one of the concepts of our romantic society is that a girl likes to believe and should believe that her husband chose her. And you know, of all the girls he could have had, he chose me. We were elected, chosen. And that's wonderful for the girl to realize you know, especially given the fact that most of you guys I, I think, out there, I think, I don't really, you know, think you could really look like you could get anybody. I hope some of you are laughing at that. Put on, therefore, as the chosen of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 15, You did not choose me, I chose you. And that should thrill the heart of every single Christian on the planet. To realize that God has centered His affection and His desire in them and that they are the ones whom He chose. I mean, how wonderful, folks, it would be if every single person that names the name of Jesus Christ rejoiced in the concept that he or she was chosen by God. And yet, the very truth of this raises anger 
in the hearts of Christians towards those who believe God concerning what He said. You need to realize that He did not choose you because you deserve to be chosen. He didn't choose you because of the way that you look, the way you live, the way you pray, the way you study, the way you give, the way you accept, the way you receive, or anything else. He chose you before the foundation of the world and He placed you in Christ that you might be holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. We are chosen people. And it kind of bothers me when I hear Christians say, well, you know, the only chosen people are the Jews. Hogwash. I am God's chosen child, and so are you if Christ died in your place. And holy does not say we don't sin. Holy means we are absolutely set apart for God. The problem is that Christians by the score decide that they're going to set themselves apart for God. The truth is God set us apart for Himself. We didn't do it. He did that. And we are loved by God. Early in my life as a Christian, one of the things I struggled with was eternal security and does God really love me? And, and the person that led me to the Lord, I had him eating antacids all day long. You know, because I just couldn't hit him with enough questions. And now I think, you know, well, I, I kind of look at my life today and see how the Lord seems to be paying me back for that. Anyhow, it was, it was in my early days as a believer. And when I began to comprehend in very small ways what God had done for me in Christ, and I used to cry out, well, I don't love Him very much. You know, He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I'd stop and I'd realize that I didn't seem to do a very good job of that. So obviously, you know, then He didn't, or I didn't love Him very much. And I'd see that Israel didn't keep the commandments of God, and that God's face was turned against Israel. And I had to do a bit of growing before I realized that that wrath of God was turned against Christ, that the seal of my redemption is not that I love the Lord Jesus Christ, but that the Lord Jesus Christ loves me. And my life has never been the same since. God not only chose me, God not only set me apart, but God loves me. It's the basis of that comprehension that will allow the rest of the verse to work out, work itself out. We do, we, we obey, if you want to use that term. We, we work, we obey, we do. Not so that God will do something. We do because of what God in the person and work of Christ has done. The awesome wonder of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus is what transforms our lives. It is what conforms us to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is why I chose to go verse by verse as we await our Lord's appearing. The beginning of this ministry concerned itself primarily with the question of when our Lord would appear. And that drew a large following. And then the Lord laid it upon my heart to be concerned with how we would appear before Him. Interesting, isn't it? And views plummeted. I remind you of John 6, and He said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. Because I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Dear friends, our comprehension of the completeness of the finished work of Jesus Christ, it doesn't reduce the incentive for evangelism or the need for it. It doesn't, or, or, or the desire for holiness in our lives, it doesn't diminish that. It doesn't lead to a life of careless indifference or, or licentiousness. It is, in fact, that very thing that instills enthusiasm. It creates zeal. It does the very opposite of what those who 
reject these precious truths, you know, claim. I'm reminded of 2 Peter 1.4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That's doctrine. That through these, through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.